Okay. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, uh, yes. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, I am Maciej Matuszewski. I am one of the uh, uh, secretaries of the Northeast Branch of the uh, Institute of Physics, and I'd like you to, 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 to welcome all of you to our a first online lecture, which this week will be with uh, Dr. Lawrence Wilson uh, from the University of York. Uh, so, uh, as, as you have seen uh, from the, 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 the slides at, at the start, uh, our next lecture will be on uh, March the, the, the uh, oh, sorry, on April uh, the 15th, apologies, uh, and it will be by Dr. Almond Beige from the University of Leeds on the topic of different ways of seeing light. And our next uh, talk after that will be on May 27th. Uh, more details are, are, for, are, are upcoming, but, but just so we can save the date, May the 27th. Uh, just a bit of housekeeping now. Uh, we, we are recording, uh, but this is a webinar, so don't worry, we won't be able to see or hear you on the recording. Uh, there is a chat uh, which uh, can be uh, sent to 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 the entire audience. Uh, but if you wish to have, uh, if, if you wish to ask uh, Lawrence any questions, uh, then it is better to use the the, the the questions option. That just makes it a bit easier for us to keep track of the questions. Uh, only uh, uh, only the organizers will be able to see the questions. Uh, so uh, don't worry about other people being able to see them. Uh, uh, so if you don't want your name to be read out on the recording. Uh, please just, just mention that in, in the question text. Uh, so I think that's everything I need to say. So I would like to again introduce uh, Dr. Lawrence Wilson, who is a senior lecturer in the Department of Physics at the University of York. Uh, he, his research area is biophysics and bioengineering, and uh, he looks at the development of new optical microscopy methods used to study microorganisms. And today he'll be giving us a talk on the, on the subject learning physics from ancient microbes uh, and uh, yeah uh, thank you Lawrence. Thanks very much for the introduction that's very kind. Um, so this is a bit of a strange talk in a way because I, I'm a physicist but I've been dabbling in biology probably since the end of my PhD and the, the picture you can see here is sort of the ultimate bit of biology is the only time I've ever really done some proper field work before. Um, Excuse me, I'm just getting some messages there. Um, so this is a, a picture of Great Salt Lake uh, in Utah in the States. And in, in the front, there's a, there's a silhouetted figure is my poor long suffering wife who, who came out with me uh, to do some field work in Great Salt Lake. And she's a physicist as well. Um, and in fact, there's a link to her PhD work later on in the talk, which I'll get to. But I'm interested in primarily developing um, optical microscopes. So uh, this is very very kind of the introduction to mention that. So this is where I spend most of my life. I'm in a lab um, surrounded by microscopes and lasers and computers as well. So my background is in biological and soft matter physics and that really means anything that you can see in a microscope so it's too small to see but it's it's big enough to not be quantum. So it lies in that kind of strange regime, a, a sort of mesoscopic mesoscale regime where phenomena like Brownian motion are important and um, surface forces do slightly strange things as well I'll get to that a bit later but I'm an experimentalist and this is this is a picture of my lab and you you can tell I'm an experimentalist there's lots of lasers going on through optical fibers and shining down into a microscope and this is the this is the point of view from which we uh, frame our research I like the idea of having microscopes that are quite simple but there's a lot of heavy lifting done the clever stuff if you like is in the image analysis algorithms and what that means is not just that you can take data and then analyze it in lots of different ways afterwards, but also that you can simplify the system right down and that makes it more amenable to use in the wild and in unusual circumstances that let us probe new areas that we can't otherwise access in the lab. Um, so we've got some interesting applications of this technology. The technology is interesting, but the applications for me are the, the sort of the driving, the driving aspect. And three of the main themes in my lab at the moment are studying Leishmania parasites. So this is something where there's a heading on the slide here. This is a, a speciality at University of York. There's a big development program in um, trying to cure a disease that's caused by these parasites. Um, I'm interested in the interactions of predatory bacteria with prey bacteria, because there's an idea that you can apply predatory bacteria to overcome antimicrobial resistance which is a big theme I'm sure you've seen this in the newspapers and lastly um, 
algal systems as well. So algae are an interesting source of biofuels. And this is something I want to come back to at the end as well. But I wanted to put this out there because I, try, I wanted to convince you that I am a physicist before I get into biology. But there is an annoying bit of biology that has to come as a layer on top of the physics. Um, so, but it's biology. We, we, we can do that. Well, most people here are physicists. I'm sure, I'm sure we'll cope. Um, so, in your previous science education, most people here will have had some sort of scientific backgrounds. Um, you get diagrams that look like this. This is something from the National Geographic. It's the tree of life. And what this tells us is that organisms, and these are all animals here, are related to each other. If you go back in time, we shared a common ancestor. If you look at the, the family tree, the points where the branches of the tree meet are where there's a common ancestor. So this is just the animals, but I'm more interested um, in ancient life forms, things that were precursors to animals and plants and everything else. And this is what the, the family tree looked like until about 1970-ish. So in the top left-hand corner, there's the red parts, and these are called eukaryotes. They've got DNA in a membrane, um, and that's the higher things like plants, animals, fungi, the things that we meet in everyday life. There are also some protozoa, parasites, um, amoebas, some, something like the leash mania that I mentioned earlier on. And then over the right hand side of this slide, I've got the big blue section and these are the bacteria. And in fact, bacteria are fantastically diverse um, range of microorganisms that live in almost every imaginable niche on the planet. But back in the 1970s, a man called Carl Woese was doing some molecular biology, which I don't understand the details of, but I don't need to. Um, and he discovered that in fact, the things he was looking at, which were producing methane, didn't seem to fit into the bacteria. And it turned out they were a third branch of the tree of life, and these are called the archaea. And they're interesting because if you look at the very centre of this diagram, there is, it just says Luca on the slide, but that stands for last universal common ancestor. So the, the current working model is that all life radiated from a single universal ancestor. <laughs> And as they spread out, some of the features that were useful to cells, simple forms of life, were kept, and the things that weren't useful disappeared through evolution. But the interesting thing about the archaea is that in some ways they're like bacteria, and in some ways they're like eukaryotes. They've got bits of both in their biology. And that creates an interesting situation. People thought that they were bacteria for a long time because they look like bacteria, and they live in some of the same environments. But in fact, they've been pushed right to the margins often and they were best known to start off with from very extreme conditions, sort of deep sea uh, vents or very salty environments, very hot environments. Um, we're starting to learn now that, in fact, they're everywhere because our technologies, which is driven by physics, it's not driven by biology. A lot of these techniques are physics driven, the um, gene sequencing and everything else uh, has let us see where these organisms live in the wild. But the best known archaea are found in salty environments, I would argue. And that's, that was sort of my angle into this project. So I started thinking about um, how small things move around. This is fundamentally a fluid dynamics problem, and it's surprising how quickly you get into something that looks like physics when you think about microorganisms. So you've probably seen movies on TV of bacteria swimming around. Well, the question is, how do bacteria swim? Well, if you've not seen this before, um, they've got little rigid helical propellers that stick out the back of the cell, something like E. coli has these, and these propellers are driven by rotary motors embedded in the cell membrane. And they're really fascinating things. They're almost identical to electric motors. So if you have a toy car with an electric motor in it, it's got a rotor and a stator, and there's a current that drives a sort of um, motion of the rotor relative to the stator. And in fact, there's the same sort of system in the bacterium as well. A bacterium has a stator system, as a few molecules around the outside, and a rotor that sits in the middle. And as, as opposed to using electrons like an electric motor would, bacteria use protons. So there's a flux of protons passing through the motor, and that's what gets the motor to spin around. And what you have is a little tiny cell. It's driven by this helical propeller. But if you're very small, um, life is a different kind of game to what you might expect at macroscopic scales. So on the scale of bacteria, and bacteria are maybe one to two microns in size, Brownian motion is constantly randomizing everything. So the question is, how do you get around in the presence of this randomizing effect? 
And there's a classic experiment, which was done by somebody who actually got their PhD in physics. There's a scientist in the States called Howard Berg, who built a microscope in the 1970s that was capable of following a single cell around to try and figure out how they made their way in the world. How do they get from A to B? How do they sniff out chemicals that are going to benefit their, their lifestyle? So it turns out what they do is they run for a straight, in a straight line for about a second and they stop and they change direction. And they keep doing this, this what they call a run and tumble behavior. And slowly this pattern of runs and tumbles can be used to sniff out their environment. So if they're, as they're swimming, if they're sensing that life is getting better, they swim a little bit longer in that direction before they change direction. And they always ultimately change direction, but it's, it's the length of the individual runs that they can shift to be longer or shorter in order to help them navigate. So, I've got a, a movie here. Uh, this is, so this is actually a movie of fluorescently stained bugs. Um, this is from Howard Berg's lab um, in the US. And you can see on this movie, I hope, there are little cell bodies being pushed along by these helical bundles of filaments. It's a bit difficult to see that they're helices because this is a 2D projection, but the cells are being pushed along by this bundle of helical filaments at the back and occasionally one of the helical filaments break out and that's what causes the cell to change direction. So I'm not going to go into the details of exactly what they do, the signals inside. It's an interesting sort of signal transduction system. I like putting this slide in my undergraduate lectures in physics because it's an interesting example of crystallinity in nature. So it turns out E. coli has a crystalline nose at the front of the cell. And the reason it's a crystal is because if a molecule binds to one bit, um, it increases the probability of more molecules binding. And there's some really interesting physics, some biological molecular physics going on there. I'm not going to go into um, the details of how that works, but it's an interesting example, again, of how physics has influenced biology. Because you can see this grey picture at the bottom from a paper taken by a colleague of mine, Ariane Briegel, who's working in the Netherlands. Um, she's used cryoelectron tomography. So there's some good physics and mathematics that go into this method that lets you visualise very small structures um, with unprecedented resolution. So she's been working on that and you can see just about in the centre, this is a slice through the nose of an E. coli bacterium, you can see just about a little regular array of crystalline nose molecules. This is what the bacterium uses and it sends a signal from the nose to the tail and that's what governs how often the cells change direction. And um, there's a whole load of other stuff the cell does. I'm not really that interested in the, the nuts and bolts of it. It turns out that the cell's got clever ways of adapting if it suddenly gets a huge influx of um, nutrients. Um, it's got ways of, kind of making that signal smaller and there's interesting bits of signal processing. I'm not going to go into that too much. This is the bit that interests me the most. So I've got two pictures on the right hand side of the slide and the left hand of the two pictures is a diagram of a bacterial flagellar motor. So you can see from this kind of little cartoon schematic, there's a cell membrane, a little motor poking out through the top, and there's a, a, a rotor and there's a stator and all stuff's labelled. We know this very well. What we don't know very well is the thing on the right hand side. And this is the equivalent structure, but in archaea. So if you remember earlier on, I said that there are these things that look like bacteria, but they behave differently. Um, in fact, it turns out that nature has found the same solution to the problem of getting around twice, and it's found it in slightly different ways. So the, back, the archaea have these helical filaments, but they've evolved from a different structure. They use a different power source. They use ATP, which is, you might remember from old science GCSEs, is the muscle energy source. It's the energy source that drives um, motion in our muscles. They use a different energy source, but nature has evolved the same mechanical engineering solution twice, which I think is quite interesting. Okay, so a lot of bacteria swim around pretty fast. Um, this is a, a picture taken by Remy Collin when he was working in my, or it's a video taken by Remy Collin when he was working in my lab um, a few years ago. Um, E. coli, I've got some sort of classic bacteria on the right hand side. These all swim pretty fast. I mean, they're swimming fractions of um, a millimetre per second, which if you're one micron in size is, is quite remarkable. Um, in comparison to their size, they're some of the fastest swimmers in nature. So bacteria swim pretty fast and we understand more or less um, how bacteria swim. Um, some archaea swim very fast as well. 
so I've put some names in Latin of Archaea up at the top of the screen here. And these guys swim fast. It's interesting to note that Archaea are the only things in nature that produce methane. So that's one of the reasons we know that the stuff that produces methane, um, Archaea. Uh, and they do some other interesting things. I've got some pictures up at the top right hand corner. Um, I love going to talks by physicists when they say, well, you know, cells have to be a certain shape. A bacterial cell has to be the shape of a tic tac because that's what the laws of physics say. And then you go looking in a pond and you find a square one. So there's a picture at the top right hand corner there of a square cell. Um, this is from a very salty environment. And these are the organisms I'm going to focus on. So the, the thing about the salt loving archaea is that they don't move very fast. But that kind of leads on to some interesting physical questions about what's the point of moving at all. And that's where I'm going to get on to next. Um, we do know that these cells have rotary motors. So we know some little bits and pieces about them. But beyond that, all we know is that they move slowly and then everyone ignores them because they say they're boring. So I'm going to try and motivate why you might want to look at these things in a bit more detail. Um, so to look for these things in the wild, I, I went out and I visited Salt Lake City and went looking for these things in um, these salt loving archaea in the Great Basin in the US. And I visited three sites, not knowing what on earth I was doing because I'm a physicist, not a biologist. So I went out, didn't even take any wellies. That was stupid as well. But, that, but there we go. You live and learn. Um, so I visited some of these interesting places looking for looking for archaea. This is me taking a, a, a nice sample from Lake Mono in California. Um, not really knowing what I was looking for. There's a lot of a lot of driving to do around the southwest of the United States, but some of the most interesting stuff came out of the Great Salt Lake um, in Utah. And this is known as a haven of diversity for these weird salt loving organisms. So we picked out a few different places um, that we could take samples from. Um, this is my uh, drill based microscope that I built to take out onto the Great Salt Lake with me. This is powered by a cordless drill battery. It's good experimental physics. $200 microscope from eBay, drill a few holes in it, power it with a drill battery. Excellent stuff. And it looks like it's a nice place to do science. I'm on a beach, um, except that I learned the hard way that going to Utah in January is not a particularly pleasant experience. The air temperature was minus 10. And that was the day I learned that I can't use my little touchpad on my computer with the gloves on. So it was, it, it was a slightly unpleasant experience. Um, somewhat ghoulishly, you can see this foam down at the margin of the lake. Um, it turns out these are the carcasses of the various microorganisms that live in there, because the microorganisms have got fatty layers around the outside. And when they die, these fatty layers break away and form this sort of nasty looking foam around the border of the lake. And occasionally tufts of it sort of blow away like tumbleweed across the beach. But it's a fairly hostile environment. It's extremely salty. And lots of things don't like living in salt, as you, you might well be aware. We use salt to preserve food and, and various other things. And um, on land, there are all sorts of other organisms wandering around, sort of coyotes wondering what the hell I was doing and looking at me askance. Um, but there are two main parts of Great Salt Lake. The part that I just showed you is the south part. And there's a north part as well. If you look at this map here, you can see the distinction between the south and north part. And this distinction happens because there's a causeway that's been built across the lake. And as the water fills the north end, it evaporates and deposits the salt. So the salt is virtually at saturation in the north half of the lake. And because it's so salty, not a lot can live there, but my salt loving microbes can. And they're this sort of fantastic pink color. So this is a picture taken by um, Jamie Butler, who's one of my collaborators from the Great Salt Lake Institute in Utah, in Salt Lake City, sorry. Um, and during the summer, the whole lake turns pink just because of the sheer volume of these weird salt loving things. Um, there are lots of salt crystals that form on the margins of the lake and the bugs live inside them. They live on the surfaces of the salt crystals. Um, this is in summer. Of course, I went there in winter and couldn't really access the north arm. I got some bits and pieces while I was there, but it's a pretty hostile environment. But anyway, we got some samples from Great Salt Lake, so we brought those back to the lab. Um, there's another location I was interested in comparing as well. So I found some salt loving things in Utah, and I knew from when my wife was doing her PhD, there was a site much closer to us. And some of you in the physics community might be familiar with Bulby Mine. And Bulby Mine is a particle physics, well, it's a working mine, but there's a laboratory now that's a, a particle physics research facility. And it's the, the deepest working mine in Europe. And this is where they set up particle detectors looking for rare events, because these particle detectors are underneath a huge amount of rock, over a kilometre of rock. And this 
helps to filter out cosmic rays, radiation from the sun, and they can do things like look for dark matter down there. And that's what my wife is doing. She's a she's a proper physicist, right? But because it's a salt mine, I thought, ah, salt loving things. I wonder if there are any archaea living down there. And actually, Charles Cockell, who works at the University of Edinburgh, had done some work beforehand that suggested that there are archaea down there. So I went looking for them. And this is the first sort of microscopic picture of the archaea. This is in fact a salt crystal and the bright lines you can see on the salt crystal are individual plates of salt that have formed and they formed around brine inclusions. There are little pockets of highly saturated um, salt water inside the salt crystal and there's an interesting backstory there because in the literature that surrounds the idea of extreme organisms there, there are stories that keep coming out of organisms that are found buried in very, very old deposits of rock. And the, the front runner at the moment was when uh, people went to a cave in Mexico where they've got these huge uh, salt stalactite-like formations. They're not strictly stalactites, but stalactite-like formations. And deep inside these formations, people have found tiny pockets of brine. And they've managed to take the, the, the contents of these brine pockets out and grow it up, and they've grown cells out of them. And that's interesting because the pockets of brine formed hundreds and hundreds of thousands, hundreds of millions of years ago. And there's some talk that these organisms have been inside pockets of brine for considerably longer than most other fossil records. And that begs some interesting questions about physics and how long molecules remain stable for. And this is quite controversial because a lot of people say, well, you know, okay, you've got this salt, you've grown an organism out of a, a pocket of salt water that you found, but how do you know it wasn't contaminated from something else? But these stories keep coming. And if you're talking about having a, a record of microorganisms that have been buried in salt for half a billion years, and then you you, you take them away and you can grow them up again, that's, that's quite a compelling um, piece of natural history, I suppose, in some ways. But anyway, what you've got here is a dark field microscope picture of a salt crystal. And dark field microscopy, as you might be familiar with, some people perhaps, is where you take a sample, and you put it on a microscope, and you shine a light at an angle through your sample. And this is a bit like when you're sitting in a dark room, and it's a sunny day outside, and you split the curtains a little bit, and there's a beam of sunlight that comes in, and you can see little dust particles moving around. So this is a this is a, a nice dark field picture and you can see the salt crystals and you can see pink dots around the bottom of the picture. And these are the archaea themselves. They, they've got this distinctive pink color and that's how we recognize them. But the thing is, if you I, I mean, I've sort of spoiled the punchline a little bit because we know that there are archaea down there. But the question is, when you go down the vine with your bucket and you're trying to find a complementary sample to the one you've got from Utah, um, how do you find the organisms? So I can show you a video here. So this is a video at true life speed of what happens if you take a sample of mine water and you put it under a microscope. I'll leave that there for a couple of seconds. Okay. So what you can see is a, a black field with some white specks in it. And the white specks occasionally shimmer a little bit and they kind of drift around a little bit. And the question is, how do you know if these things are bits of dirt, bits of rock, just doing Brownian motion? Because we know on a microscopic length scale, if these things are one or two micrometers across, they're going to be jostled by the water molecules. So there's going to be a, a, an apparent sense of motion, even though they're not moving under their own steam. Well, it turns out if you take this movie, I've got this black and white movie, if I colour the first frame in the movie red, and I colour the last frame in the movie in purple, and as I go through in time, if I colour each frame a different colour of the rainbow from red through to violet, I can superimpose those all together. And if a particle is just more or less staying still, all of these colours add up together. But if the particle is moving, you get these little rainbow coloured streaks. So I mean, this is a fairly naive way to look at swimming things, but there's this very distinctive set of motions here that you get the, the streaks and you can tell which way they're going because they start at the red end and they go towards the purple end. But it's a nice sort of rough and ready assay to see if there's anyone swimming in your sample. And in fact, this, this sort of distinction between something that's moving under Brownian motion versus something that's moving under its own steam is an absolutely key marker of life. So uh, when I go to Bulby Mine, occasionally there are people from NASA there in the European Space Agency who build probes to go to other 
places in the solar system that might contain life. And I, I'm, I'm lobbying very hard to say that, you know, this, this, I would say, is one of the best ways of looking for things that might possibly be alive. And biochemistry is difficult, but this is such a rough and ready assay. You need almost nothing to do it. But if something's swimming, that's a pretty good sign that it's actually alive. Anyway, so we went down to the mine. We got some samples. We know there are cells in there. And I had a very talented PhD student called Katie Thornton, who came from a biology background. She did lots of clever things, and she found the whole genome sequence for these microorganisms. I don't know anything about genome sequencing, but this stuff is pretty much plug and play these days. You stick the bugs in a jar, you get rid of the outer membrane, you purify the DNA, and then you send it to Birmingham. And there's some clever people in Birmingham who run it through um, whole genome sequencing stuff. They put everything back together. Katie does some wizardry, and we can look at components inside the cell. Um, I am not a geneticist. I don't really know what's going on, but I know enough to see that there is this little diagram with arrows on it, and that just tells me what components are present within the cell. And I'm not going to spend too long focusing on that, but this proves to us that not only have we got organisms from Great Salt Lake and from Bulby Mine, but they've got stuff in them. They've got the components of motors, so we know how they're likely to swim. We've seen under the microscope that they do swim. So this gives starting to build up a picture of. Um, how these organisms get around because no one's really looked at archaea before there's a whole branch of the tree of life that's basically unknown certainly compared to bacteria and eukaryotes so some of the interesting things in here um when we were taking apart and katie sort of got this parts list for the bugs in her sample these archaea have stolen chemical sensing systems from bacteria so when I was talking earlier on about this kind of funny run and tumble that bacteria do, and E. coli swim much faster, and it is running in a straight line, changing direction, all the rest of it, they've got a chemical sensing system, this crystalline nose and everything else, and archaea have stolen it historically by this mechanism called horizontal gene transfer. But this, this leads to a few different questions. So we've got our two species, um, but they swim a lot slower than E. coli swims. And in this picture of E. coli swimming, changing direction, swimming, changing direction, the idea there is that they're, they're outpacing, in some sense, Brownian motion. But our cells are swimming much, much slower, and Brownian motion is randomizing the direction much quicker. And yet they've repurposed the bacterial machinery to help them get around. So this is a fantastic statistical physics problem. How does this work? So, back to the lab. We have our exciting holographic microscope. So this is our stock in trade, um, really, for most of our day-to-day -day work in the lab. Um, a holographic microscope, well, it makes holograms. I'm sure most people here, if you're in the Institute of Physics, are familiar with a hologram. Um, a hologram is just a way of capturing three-dimensional information about something it's like taking a it's like taking a photograph but unlike a photograph you capture not just the amplitude of light that's incident on a recorder and that can be a piece of film or a camera you also capture the phase of light that's incident on the camera so i've got a little cartoon on the right hand side here and that's a cartoon of what's going on inside the microscope so the microscope we have a laser shining down from the top some of the light is scattered by whatever's in the sample and some of the light passes beside whatever we're looking at what you get down at the bottom down on your digital camera is this kind of diffraction ring pattern and because the light that you've got shining in the background is a series of plane waves you can reconstruct what the phase and the amplitude are of the optical field at the detector and that means if you know the phase and amplitude at one point in the optical field you can apply all the stuff that we know um, Maxwell's laws and everything else we can reconstruct the whole shape of the optical field and it's actually it's quite a daft way of doing it really so um the way we do it is to model each pixel in our hologram as a point source with an intensity that's set by the pixel value so dark rings on the cartoon image on the right we set each pixel within a dark ring to be a low intensity emitter the pixels within the bright ring to be a high intensity emitter and we just say well what will the optical field look like if all of these point source emitters were emitting at the same time shining in the same direction and actually you can calculate what that field would look like throughout the whole of your sample and that's nice because it means that we've captured in a single 2d image what the three-dimensional configuration of our sample is or at least the three-dimensional configuration of the optical fields what the light looks like 
Um, that's kind of hand wavy. So he, here is here's the actual thing. Here's what it looks like. This is a bunch of E. coli swimming in my holographic microscope. And you can see it's a bit grainy because they don't scatter much light. So I have to turn the contrast up a bit. But you can see sets of diffraction rings moving around and sort of already intuitively you can say, OK, well, I know the X, Y position of this cell because I can see where the rings are in the field of view. I know how big the pixels on my camera are and I can say roughly how far away it is because the further away a cell is from the focal plane, the bigger the rings are. So you can kind of intuitively see that the information about where the bacteria are in 3D is encoded in the video you're looking at. We can do a little bit better than that. We have um, an image like the one you see here. This is a single frame. And by applying an algorithm, we can refocus this image numerically. So I take this image, and I do this process of you know, imagining point sources and everything else. And as I scan through the image, hopefully you can see, and this will loop round again, I hope, objects that come into focus and then pass out of focus again. And in fact, you can immediately see the trick we use to localize objects. There's a fantastic bit of wave, classical wave optics known as the Goy phase anomaly. And this was discovered in the 1800s by a French physicist. And he discovered that if you have a spherical wave coming to a focus and then spreading out again, it picks up a phase shift as it goes through the focus. And it's a little bit counterintuitive, but that's what you're seeing here, because as I scan through my sample, and remember, this is like turning the focus knob on the microscope, but it's all done with an algorithm. This is just taking a single frame of data and calculating these defocused images numerically. As I scan through the stack, you'll see that the center of the objects start off as dark, flip to light as I pass through the center of the object. So there's a really easy way of telling how far away I have to focus through my sample until the object that I'm interested in comes into focus. So we can do this game, lots of big computers. We can isolate the three-dimensional coordinates of all the cells in one particular field of view. So this is the data that I got from the last field of view that you looked at. I've reconstructed it and the, the grids on the floor, the grid on the floor you see here is um, 50 micron squares and I've drawn the bacteria much bigger than they really are. But I can apply it not just to bacteria, but to my archaea as well. And so we can image these little guys swimming around in a volume of about a cubic millimetre. And what I'm doing with all of this data is I'm trying to understand how these slow swimming bacteria manage to overcome Brownian motion and get around, because it's not at all obvious to me how they can do that, stealing stuff from bacteria. So I mean, archaea, um, because they swim slowly, are constantly being thrown off course by Brownian motion. And you can sort of see it from these trajectories. Each trajectory here is something like 60 seconds of data. They swim slowly and they, they jiggle around and they occasionally veer off course and they occasionally change direction as well. Um, so we boil down about 100 gigabytes of video data into about 200 megabytes of, of track data. And we can start to say something about how these cells swim. Um, the most interesting thing for me is when they change direction. So they swim for a while, and then they reverse, and that's all they do. Not like E. coli, which swims along and throws its little flagella out in different directions and changes direction. These archaea swim very slowly. And they kind of just coast on Brownian motion, really, and occasionally they reverse direction, and that's all. That's their only way of getting about. So they don't tumble very often either. And this is a bit of a mystery, and it's not. I wanted to start off with if this was just us because. When I first looked out under the microscope at these things swimming around, I thought this can't be right. Because if you swim for a long direction, for a long time without changing direction, Brownian motion randomizes your direction very quickly. So th there's something here that isn't making sense. And it's not just us that found this, other people, other groups found this as well. So this is this is really the puzzle. So we, we work on single cell 3D tracking of bacteria, say, so, okay, E. coli tumbles once every second. It reorients due to Brownian motion on a time scale of about three seconds because the reorientation time scale depends on Brownian motion, depends on the size of the particle. This is Einstein's game. And so the classic work says that for E. coli, if it runs for five seconds, it's going to lose its way and it's not going to be able to find its way around in the wild. 
So our cells reverse every 15 seconds, more or less, and I've got a histogram of run durations in the top right hand corner. So this tells me that the mean run duration is about 15 seconds. It's an exponential distribution. Incidentally, you can go back and use Boltzmann statistics and figure out on and off rates of molecules on the cell's nose. Let, let's, let's not go into that. But our cells reverse every 15 seconds. They reorient due to Brownian motion on a much shorter time scale than bacteria because they're smaller. Um, and they're using the same chemical system as bacteria. And none of this makes sense. So I do what every good physicist does and say, well, I can look in my microscope and I get about a cubic millimeter of space, but I can build a simulation of this and I can do some really nice long time simulations. So I say, well, what happens if my cell swims for a day or a year or much longer? Does it make sense? Can these things actually find their way around? Um, so spoilers, yes, they can. Um, we use one of the nice things about finding a chemical sensing system that's present in other cells is we can take the maths and the physics that's known about these other cells and apply it straight to our cells. So we've read off the parts list of components inside our weird salt loving microbes and we can build a model of them based on what we know in bacteria because they've stolen the, the important stuff. So we build a simulation and we simulate how cells are able to swim up a chemical gradient. Um, there are three pictures here. There's one on the left which is just a non-swimming cell. So if the cell couldn't swim, it sort of bumbles around. And after about, I think this is about 12 hours, um, the cell sort of inhabits a volume of about 100 micrometer, um, something like oh, two, 200, me, 200 micron cubed volume. That's the sort of volume it can explore. If the cell can swim, and there's this pink trail on top, um, it can go a lot further. It can go a lot further in a sort of deterministic way. It can swim up a gradient. So I've simulated the chemical gradient. So the good stuff is at the right of this graph at the top and the cell is able to make its way up the chemical gradient. So there is a benefit to actually moving around and using all this extra energy um, compared to just drifting under Brownian motion. And E. coli, of course, at the bottom shoots away. It's five times as fast. It can climb gradients left, right and centre, no problem at all. Now, the thing is that these cells live in very different environments. E. coli lives in our gut, in which case it's got energy sources everywhere. It's surrounded by metabolizable carbon compounds, all this lovely stuff. The archaea live in salt mines where there is nothing or the, there's organic mo there are organic, organic molecules that kind of eventually trickle through the soil and through the rock above, but it's very scarce. And um, similarly in the salt lake, the salt lake's a funny one because um, it's very seasonal. So there are big uh, feast and famine cycles. So when the brine shrimp all grow up in the Great Salt Lake, suddenly there's food everywhere and the brine shrimp go away again, they all die and there's no food left at all. So there are long periods in the year where the cells are starved, even if they can feast at other times. So you, these cells need to be able to get around very efficiently. And this is where some of the physical arguments really come in. So what we find is that the, the swimming speed is proportional to the fractional drift speed. So, so what this means is, I've got, drawn a graph at the bottom left hand corner, and this says that if my cell is swimming at whatever speed is on the X axis, how quickly can it drift up a chemical gradient? And this tells me that more or less, if you're swimming faster than about one or two micrometers a second, um, you drift up the chemical gradient at about 10% of your swimming speed. That's what the 0.1 means. And there are three different swimming styles that we've investigated. The red data points mean cells that can go forwards and backwards, forwards and backwards, and they can alter the length of their forward and backward runs. The black data points are what happens if you can only lengthen your run in the forward direction, but not in the backward direction. And the blue one is what happens if you can only shorten your run and not lengthen it. I mean, this is sort of nuts and bolts. You don't need to know the details, but the three different potential swimming patterns that we've investigated. And what this tells us is there's not much of an advantage in swimming slower than about one to two micrometers a second. That's about optimal. If you swim any faster than that, your swimming speed, your ability to drift up a chemical gradient um, isn't improved in a sense because the fractional drift speed compared to the swimming speed is going to be the same. So if I swim at 10 microns a second, I drift up the gradient at one micron a second. If I swim at one micron a second, I drift up at 0.1 microns a second. Okay, but there's a second effect as well. And this is to do with efficiency. And this is quite a well-known relationship in physics and engineering that says that if you want to swim 
twice as fast if you're a small thing swimming in a very viscous fluid and at small length scales and if you're a small organism fluids do appear very viscous to you um, your swimming efficiency is proportional to one over v squared so that means if you want to swim twice as fast you've got to put in four times as much power to overcome friction it's a sort of scaling relationship there and i've plotted on the bottom right hand corner this is swimming speed against efficiency uh, it's a slightly funny metric of efficiency on the vertical axis but this is a logarithmic scale and what this tells you is that if you swim much faster than about one micron per second your efficiency just drops like a stone so what we see from these two graphs is that our our archaea are really at a kind of sweet spot they're able to drift so if they're swimming any slower they wouldn't really be able to drift properly but at the same time they're swimming very efficiently because they're swimming slowly so there's this kind of contradictory aims these, these sort of contrasting energetic arguments that explain why the cells have the swim at the speed they do so this is the kind of take-home message that i wanted to put at the end of the talk so these salt loving archaea odd things um physicists can go and play with these things we don't worry like biologists do about what kind of model systems we're playing so we're not worried about that but they've stolen and repurposed bacterial swimming machinery and using this, they can follow chemical trails very effectively, very efficiently. They can overcome the random forces in Brownian motion. And in fact, Brownian motion, now this, this is a slightly controversial bit. This is the thing that sends my physics spidey sense uh, buzzing a little bit. The Brownian motion enhances their foraging ability. So whereas E. coli swim and then flick out a flagellum to change direction and flick out a flagellum to change direction, that's a very energetically costly, uh, an energetically costly process. Our archaea don't worry about that. They just let the Brownian motion reorient them as they swim. So they almost harness the randomizing effect of Brownian motion in a way that really grates against my sense of what entropy is. But uh, that, that's something, that's my problem, uh, not anyone else's. I, I, I'm, I'm still coming to grips with this, I think. Um, so we've built from this um, knowledge, we've done lots of experiments and we've built simulations based on what we know of the internal systems of the archaea. And we think they couldn't be a lot more efficient if they tried and that they're optimally adapted to poor nutrient environments. Um, I'd like to put in a little bit of stuff at the end, um, applications, because at the moment it's a bit sort of uh, highfalutin. I mean, th this is the audience to talk about basic science, right? I mean, we're, most of the people here, I imagine, have a, have a love of basic science the way that I do. But there are some interesting things that come from the study of extremophiles, which maybe aren't, aren't quite so well known. Um, the first one is that um, we've taken chemicals from other extremophiles, uh, particularly um, this one called TAC polymerase, uh, which gives rise to a technology known as PCR, which of course is everywhere at the moment, COVID tests and everything else. If you have organisms that live in extreme conditions, you can repurpose their biology to do interesting um, industrial biochemical things, um, particularly because salt loving organisms are farmed to, far to produce biofuels in otherwise harsh environments where you can't grow anything else. And the archaea are part of the ecosystem there. So if you can engineer in a kind of biological bioengineering sense, communities to produce optimal, to, to produce um, biofuels at an optimal rate, that could be a real advantage and really push forward the understanding of, uh, of biofuels. The picture at the bottom right hand corner here is some salt ponds just outside San Francisco, where you can see just by the colour alone that these things are full of archaea and salt loving things that have got this pinky colour, which is due to the, the sort of rhodopsins and things that are present in the cell. Um, because archaea can sometimes use light to find their way around uh, and as an energy source as well. But that sort of very vibrant pink colour tells us what we need to know about the organisms living there. Um, but from an academic point of view, I'm interested in how physics shapes life. That, that's my sort of driving goal, uh, I think. And I'm interested in how, how life can engineer solutions to different problems of getting around if you're a small um, a small organism. Um, it's also fun for playing with toys as well. So I'm interested in developing equipment for sample collection in harsh environments. And this is this is one of my favourite movies so far. So um, this is our our new drone sample collecting system. Um, and there's there's a movie in the centre, and and you'll see our uh, our takeoff. This is in in the salt mine in in Bulby Mine, and we we sell a tape to GoPro to the top of the to the top of the drone, so we can find our way around. And you can see this thing moving down one of the mine corridors. And the idea is that because when water gets into the mine, there might be bugs in it, but if the mine is a salt mine, 
water dissolved salt and you've got to be very careful going into some of these environments so we're interested in building drone based instrumentation to go and retrieve samples and that's got potential applications in um, safety and monitoring systems in, in mind as well the mine is actually a very safe environment anyway they go to great lengths to ensure that it's safe but an extra pair of eyes and sort of technological solutions um, never hurt uh, we've also got a uh, a sort of an orange drone picture on the left hand side there and these things are uh, that's uh, one capable of landing on water and taking off from water again um, and these things can carry sort of a kilo's worth of equipment for depositing in weird bits of the mine and we're looking at monitoring the life that's living there over long periods um, this is kind of an interesting application of physics and um, we yeah we, we refer to these drones as uh, drone collins which is the one at the top that's the black drone because it's almost impossible to get it working and the orange drone is droney soprano on the grounds that it's a real thug so and um, that's the next stage that we're doing i've got a phd student working on drone stuff at the moment um but that's actually all i wanted to talk about today so i'd like to thank my collaborators as I say katie thornton did a lot of the work in this talk she's, well, she's a phd student who's graduated now um jamie and bonnie work at great salt lake institute seth at york um, and yeah, thanks very much for your attention. I'm happy to take any questions. Uh, so, so, so yeah, we will uh, probably just, just wait a, a few minutes for questions. I know it takes people a bit of time to, to, to type. Yeah. Uh, as, 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 as we mentioned before, uh, we will be able to follow questions most easily if you just type them in the, in the questions tab. I've answered all the questions yeah. now, Andrew, my groups, that's fine. Uh, perhaps while we're waiting, maybe I'll ask ask a quick question. Uh, can, 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 kind of what first got you interested in, in kind of this this uh, broad area, like like your 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 research area in general, uh, rather than this specifically? I think what my, my background was in statistical physics and soft matter things, and I think moving on to microbes is quite an easy way forward from there microbes do more interesting things and they they sort of fight back a little bit more so they're interesting problems to do with polymer physics and understanding the mechanics of micro environments and interesting medical applications as well but um, bacteria swimming around are quite a well understood system from a sort of statistical physics point of view you can model swimming cells a bit like molecules in a gas you can apply the ideal gas equations get some interesting results um, based on those. So it, it was really from that sort of soft matter point of view, moving across, um, <laughs> looking for funding in part, but actually I, I, I got, I just got interested in it. I, I think it's an interesting thing to do. And plus, because I'm a physicist, I can ask really dumb questions and no one minds in a biological context. It, it, it makes people feel superior for a while. That's, that's a great way to find good answers to questions. I think. Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, yeah, so, so I, I, I that, 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 well, for, thank, thank you in general for the uh, for the very very interesting talk, uh, and uh, uh, we've oh uh, yes we we've just got an, a question I see. Uh, can yeah. So th th there's a question about um, how something I found contradicts the concept of entropy. Uh, what was it and what do you mean? Um, yeah, th thanks very much. Um, yeah, I, I think it, I suppose it doesn't really it doesn't really contradict the concept of entropy, but I, I don't know if you get that thing when you're you're working through a physics problem and, and something just doesn't feel quite right. And, and and there's this idea that a tiny cell can be subject to something which is inherently random. And back Brownian motion is the best random source of anything we can possibly imagine. I mean, it's it's really amazing. It's the, probably the most random thing in nature. He says, going out on a limb a little bit. So how do, how do these archaea engineer order out of the chaos, the sort of very pure chaos of Brownian motion? Um, 
I don't know. And, and seeing in the literature, everyone's saying, well, you know, bacteria have to swim in straight lines and change direction and change direction. It's that straight line, which means they know where they're going and they change direction. They have to move faster and the dynamics have to move faster than Brownian motion. Otherwise, they'll never survive. And then suddenly you get these archaea that just seem to almost harness the random forces of Brownian motion, which, which I feel like they shouldn't be able to do. They're, they're, there's something sort of about the information content there. And th this is not a well-formed idea, but I've been thinking about it for a while. There's just something something I'm not entirely happy with. I, I, I don't think it, I mean, it, it's not, not fair to say it violates the concept of entropy. And we've got to be a little bit careful, of course, because entropy is an equilibrium phenomenon in thermodynamics. So you can't necessarily just map it straight onto a system that's consuming energy. That's 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 a little bit tricky, but but I, I yeah, there, there's there's something in there I'm just not quite happy with. Um, so I, I need to do a bit more thinking and a bit more theory. I think. Sorry, it's a bit of a garbled answer. <laughs> okay, uh, we're getting uh, we're getting lots of uh, thank yous, and indeed that that, that was a, a very interesting talk. Uh, by can't see any other questions uh, so I'll I'll give uh, just the closing remarks uh, so, so there's still time to ask questions during the closing remarks uh, again I, I don't know but I can take a bit of time to to type things uh, so, so so yeah uh, so, so 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 my my first closing remark is is to again uh, thank uh, thank thank Lawrence for, for for really really fascinating talk uh, so the uh, the, the, the recording of this will be up on the IOP uh, branches uh, uh, YouTube channel, and the, 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 the link for that will be put up in. Uh, oh, yeah, it's just been put up in uh, in the chat. Uh, so, so uh, it's the Nations and Regions YouTube channel. Uh, go, go over to to to, uh, to to find the recording of this in a few days. And while you're waiting for that, you, you are able to find uh, plenty of recordings from uh, other branches events, and they're all uh, really, really interesting. Uh, as, a, as a reminder, our uh, next event uh, will be a Different Ways of see Seeing Light by Dr. Almut Beige on 15th of April. And the next event uh, after that uh, uh, will be on May the 27th. Uh, do please put that in, in your calendar. We'll have more details shortly. And I see we have a uh, two two new questions uh, just, just just for the end. Um, yeah. So um, I've been asked if any advice to someone who wants to have a career in research and is research what you thought it would be. Um, that's a really interesting questions. I, I find those difficult to answer. If it's a question about entropy, I'm all right. But um, so I, I think is research what you thought it would be? Yes and no. I think it's important to keep an eye on the things that you like and the things that you're interested in, even if you get beaten back in them. That that was the one piece of advice I would give. I mean, uh, certainly coming up as an undergraduate, I, I was not a stellar student by any means. I, I did OK. I got through. And I don't know, uh, one of my one of the big sort of inspirations in, in my life in physics is a guy um, at Bristol called Tanny Liverpool. Um, and he's got this great expression. He says flowers bloom at different times. So even if you, you're struggling against something that's quite adverse, you've got to keep hammering away and doggedly chipping away. Um, stay interested in things and join things like the IOP. That's a really nice way to sort of broaden your horizons. Just look around. Don't get too focused on, on the physics. I suppose that would be the best, the best advice. And going to university and doing a degree is a good place to start. I think. And and there, there was, I think, one one more question. Is is research what uh, you you thought it'd be? <laughs> um, yes, I think so. I think it's what I've made it to be. Um, that you, you can follow interesting problems in physics and in science research more broadly, because you don't have to be stuck in a silo. Um, so my my research questions are things that I kind of come up with, and there's a nice creative freedom to that in a little, in a funny sort of way. I'm also interested in pursuing some statistical physics and how that works on carnivorous plants, which is kind of a weird combination, but but it, but it, it gives you intellectual freedom, which, which I think I value a lot, um, and, and it's fun, yes. And one more question, I think, earlier. We, we, we do have a bit of time to answer that one. Mm -hmm. uh, the best way to go into biophysics. Um, 
this is interesting. So different universities have different research specialisms. Um, at York, we've got quite a lot of um, biophysics and biological physics. This is one thing I've got to be a bit careful because when biologists say biophysics, they mean protein crystallography, which is interesting, but not what I do. Um, people talk about what I do as biological physics or biophysics, usually found in physics departments. The best way to do it as an undergraduate um, is to, I would say, look at final year projects and summer projects because you can often find ways of getting a toe in, seeing if you like it, and if you don't, you, you're not committed. You, you get a kind of an eight week taster, often you can get paid for it. Um, that is the best way in, I would say. Um, and that gives you a bit of experience, which kind of helps you get onto the next stage. Uh, it looks, I think, uh, that these are all the questions. Let's just give it another few seconds in case anyone is typing anything. But yes, uh, so 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 fa thank you uh, again, Lawrence, and, and thank you to, to all the audience for, for, for coming along. Uh, oh, uh, 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 and, and another question. And yes, we, we if, if you have time, uh, then 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 yeah, we, we I think we 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 do have time for, for this, this one last question, and, and maybe indeed another one if, if people are quick. Yeah, that, that's fine. So. Um, day-to-day -day life um so uh, it depends i do teaching as well i'm not, I'm not just a researcher um but in day-to-day -day life science takes a long time so i would say that today for example i spend a long time thinking what did i do today that's a good question oh i can't remember what i did today it was only earlier today um so i've been thinking mainly about um writing up papers today so i've been responding to some referee comments on a paper i submitted a while ago and that's taken a while i'm interested in getting back to the lab so i've had to organize some time with one of my phd students because she's in a critical stage of her phd and i'm trying to work around her but i've been sort of growing growing plants up and doing some fairly boring things actually cutting bits of glass to make sample chambers is one of the things I've been doing today some sort of cutting and sticking so it's not exactly all glamour um, but it's very hands-on and you have to be quite self-motivated and manage your own time a little bit um, but it's it's quite yeah day-to-day it, it, day it's very there's a lot of variation uh, and both the teaching and research are kind of interesting interesting aspects of the job I think So uh, yeah, uh, thank you, thank you everyone. One final thing I wanted to mention is that uh, uh, th 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 this talk uh, uh, and, uh, and, and the rest of our series is, is partially uh, uh, so, so, so supported by, advertise, uh, by, 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 by advertising uh, by the uh, Newcastle Lit and Phil, who, who, who very kindly pr promote these events of the Newcastle Lit and Phil, is, uh, a, is, is a library and uh, a, a public educational institution in Newcastle, uh, and they do the, their own series of uh, uh, online lectures and talks. Uh, I have just posted a link to their website online. Uh, do, do visit that and have a look at, at their events. Uh, so thank you again one final time to everyone, and we, we hope to see you at our future events. Uh, goodbye. <laughs>